So um, I also have something to share uh, with you. Uh, my name is, uh, is Hans Kramer. Um, as I already said, I'm hosting this session, but I also represent um, InChange. And uh, InChange is a company that very much believes in uh, experiential learning and learning by doing. And um, Alphonse already addressed a bike being very Dutch. Uh, and if I look at how we have learned to ride a bicycle, that really mimics how we think about how you can learn about supply chains and value chains, getting this end-to-end -end understanding, looking at it from a cross-functional perspective, looking at the impacts of the decisions that you make in your own functional area, for instance, sales, or for instance, purchasing or operations or supply chain and planning itself, that you are aware of those impacts. Because to make supply chains run and to have proper supply chain management in place, including supply chain resilience, yeah, that requires a team spirit. Supply chain management, is a team sport. So yeah, if I reflect on how we learned how to ride a bicycle when we were kids in the Netherlands, then um, yeah, this is a bit of a rhetorical question. Did our parents give us a theory lesson? Nah, not really. They didn't give us a lecture. They didn't give us a slideshow. They didn't create a manual that they shared with us. We learned it the hard way. We learned it by doing. So we were put on a bike at a certain age. We got a very nice bike to make it a bit perhaps a bit more attractive and, and, and we were not that fearsome or not that fearful of it. And, and we learned it by doing. So we fell off, bruised our knees, our elbows, and our moms and pops put, back on, put, put us back on. And that's how we learned by doing how to ride a bicycle. Now, this is a very powerful way of learning, of course. I would not recommend doing this when you want to learn how to fly a plane or when you want, want to learn how to run a company, but still it is very powerful. So yeah, and if you if you learn like this, if you learn by experience, that learning is is uh, is works a lot better than like you're doing now, listening to me. You will forget a lot of what I tell you in this session. Um, unfortunately, you are also using your eyes. You're looking at your screen, so that makes it already better in terms of what we're sharing here today. Uh, how how able you are to retain that, but if you really have an experience then that becomes even better. So yeah, that's what, we, uh, that's what we have in mind to also do a little bit of that in this mini conference today. Uh, we also truly believe at, at InChange and by the way, also at Involvation because uh, Alphonse represents Involvation, which is a very loyal uh, and, 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 par and a valued partner of ours. We truly believe that if you want to learn, then you need to have people engaged and you need to give them an immersive experience because at the end of the day, I can take a horse to water, but I cannot make it drink. So people learn only something when they want to learn themselves. If we can, if we can tempt them to do so, not because I want to teach them something, it doesn't work that way. So learning is about engagement and immersion. And that's, that plays very, uh, that plays a very big role and is very helped by, by going into experiential learning. Now, Talking about experiential learning, then let's provide some context to supply chain resilience as well. Let's see if we can have a little bit of a taste of experiential learning when it comes to supply chain resilience. And to that effect, I've, I've brought a practical situation with me. I brought context with me. And that context is a, is a fruit juice company called The Fresh Connection, which some of you may know. Some of the people in the audience are recognized by name. Uh, and I do know for a fact that they have come across this company before in their lives. And the Fresh Connection is a, is a fruit juice company. It's quite simple in its setup. So uh, what this company is doing, it is uh, sourcing five components, as you can see on the left. And those five components, they come from five different suppliers. So that's fruit pulp and that's packaging material. And they go into an inbound warehouse. And from there on, these components get together in a mixing and bottling situation where fruit juices are being made. Six of them are being made, six blends uh, of finished products. And these six blends then go into the outbound warehouse. And from the outbound warehouse, they're being distributed to three customers. So a very simple situation, uh, this, this uh, fruit juice company compared to, to the complexity that a lot of people in the audience are up against on a daily level. So that's, that's fathomable, I, I guess. So, but what we also need to understand, and, and that's what, coming from the trenches myself and, and already saying that, that uh, supply chain management is a team sport, that's not always that well understood. Uh, and Alphonse already mentioned Joshi Sheffi and I, I read his, uh, his last book, The Power of Resilience. 
And he also brings it back to the basics. First, we have to, we need to have some basic understanding of supply chains. And he talks about five different aspects of a supply chain. So I would like to briefly go into these connected to the fresh connection, because the first thing he says that you need to understand about it, that is the parts that go into the company's products. And uh, those are the, he calls that the what, and you could actually say that's the bill of material. So the what's in the bill of material of the fresh connection are the five components that I already briefly mentioned. All the products that we're making have some sort of recipe that combines food pulp and packaging material to finished products. So we need to have a proper understanding of that uh, before, before we do anything else. And then he says, yeah, but there's more elements to it. He, he lists five and I only spoke about two. So here are, here are three more. So we have these parts that we now know and who is supplying us with those parts? Uh, there's parties involved that we need to know that we need to do business with. And those parties are sitting somewhere on the face of the earth, just like we do ourselves and just like our, 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 our customers do. So where are we with our whole footprint of our supply chain as being in the middle? And then between all these parties, there's flows going on. Uh, Alphonse already also mentioned that we have information flows and financial flows and of course, we have material flows. So that's also something that we need to know about. So yeah, looking at the Fresh Connection, we have ourselves, TFC, abbreviation for the Fresh Connection, sitting in the Netherlands. Then we have five suppliers that are providing us with these, uh, with these supplies, these components that we need to make fruit juice. And then we have our three customers and they sit in the Netherlands, uh, all three of them. So that's, uh, that's our domestic market, you could say. So um, having said that, there's a, there's a fifth part, the fifth aspect that Shefi says you should also understand very well. Eh? We know what parts go into our products. We know who supplies us. We know who the parties in the supply chain are, where they are. Uh, we know something about the flows. And now these materials that we discussed, where are they? Uh, they're all in, in some shape or form, they're all inventory. So. Uh, if we look, if we think about that, where are these inventories then? Well, we have our, our component inventory in our own inbound warehouse as the Fresh Connection. And we have our finished products in our own outbound warehouse, but there's more to it. Eh? We are also working on products that are in process. So work in process inventory. That's also uh, a location where inventory is. And then we have uh, suppliers having component supplies on the way to us, pipeline inventory. And we are shipping product towards our customers as well. So there's also pipeline inventory moving there. So um, yeah, that's a, that's a bit of the lay of the land. And we have a challenge now ahead of us because the Fresh Connection itself, like I said, a producer of fruit juices in the Netherlands, they're not doing so well. They're suffering from poor performance. And this poor performance is, is expressed by unhappy customers, but there's all kinds of other things really not going well inside the Fresh Connection. And we can do something about that. So we're gonna go through a little storyline, uh, all of us together, we're more than 150 people now in this, uh, in this mini conference. And we've all become the new management team. And we need to make sure that in the purchasing operations, sales and supply chain area, things are going better. We need to try and make the company profitable again, because as we will see in a moment, the company is running at a loss. And at the same time, since we're talking about resilience here today, we can do something about improving resilience. So that's also in the cards. Now, uh, Alphonse referred to Martin Christopher and his model about creating a resilient supply chain. So that's what we'll use as a backdrop for creating more resilience. But he also said, take it one bite at a time. Because if you look at all these squares, I think there are 14 on this slide. We don't have time to look at all 14 of them. So we need to, uh, we need to be a bit quicker and we need to prioritize here. So we're gonna take this one bite at a time. And then we're also gonna use Mentimeter for that. So I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions whilst I go through this session. And then I will touch upon, especially the dark blue elements of this particular site. So we're gonna take a look at supply chain risk management culture or culture in general. We're gonna take a look at collaboration, a bit from an external and an internal perspective. We're gonna take a short look at supply chain re-engineering, especially when it comes to understanding our supply chain. 
And then we're gonna take a brief uh, step towards agility focused especially on, on velocity. So to start with the first part here, let me introduce the storyline that I have cooked up for you. So I already said the fresh connection is not doing so well. So here we have the main screen, the cockpit of the fresh connection where you can see my name on top of the screen and I'm fulfilling all functional department at the moment. That's because of this webinar, I need to take you through it. If you are managing this company yourself, you would be divided into teams of four people and each one of you would have such a role. One of you would be responsible for purchasing, one of you would be responsible for operations, one would take care of supply chain and another person would run the sales department. And then you need to work together as a team to get this, this company out of its predicament. Because I already said, and I, I can give you a little bit of an insight, whether we like it or not, but when we run our supply chains, everything we do in there has a financial consequence as well. So at the moment, my so-called return on investment is already negative for two periods at a time. Um, and yeah, I see that I have three customers here that I briefly introduced to you, to which we are delivering our products. Uh, we have Food and Groceries, Landmark and Dominic's. Food and Groceries being a supply chain leader, that's how they perceive themselves. Landmark is more of a discounter and Dominic's is, um, is a convenience store connected to a gas station. Well, based on what I promised them, they're willing to pay me a certain amount of money for my supply chain performance, but at the moment they are heavily penalizing me and they're not happy at all. And uh, so we need to do something about this. And at the same time, we need to mind our resilience. So going back to the, my company screen, I have a little storyline for you because the first connection has come to, and it has come in a situation where there is a supermarket war going on. So retailers are warring with one another and that creates a lot of pressure from the three, from the three retailers that the Fresh Connection is, uh, is servicing. Even more pressure than there already is now since they're all giving us penalties. So they're not happy to start with anyway. So what are these supermarkets then asking for us? Well, I have contracts with them in place. If I go to the sales department, I see on the right hand side, the three customer names that I briefly introduced and I have a contract with all of them. And in these contracts, I make an agreement with them about service level, as you can see on screen, but also very much, uh, very important. I make, I make a promise about shelf life. That means I'm selling a food product. A food product has a certain freshness and it has a best before date. And they would like to have the biggest part of that freshness still remaining when I deliver to them because that makes their own inventory management a lot easier. Now, uh, and what these companies are telling me at the moment, they say, well, we are in this, in this in the retail war, in this supermarket war. We want to promote products of our suppliers more heavily. And so they are going to increase the so-called promotion pressure on us. They wanted more actions of two for the price of one, three for the price of two, and they want us as the Fresh Connection to support them more heavily. At the same time, they want a fresher product because if we're gonna support them more heavily on promotions, demand volatility will increase. Their inventory management becomes harder. They may, uh, they may not forecast well enough for themselves. So if they have more shelf life remaining of our products that makes our inventory management easier and, and uh, that also decreases the risk of obsolete products in their, in their own inventory. So, um, as VP of sales, I'm responsible for making these agreements and I'm focusing on the cultural part now of becoming resilient. Well, the culture in the management team, all the four roles, is not so much focused on collaboration. As a salesperson, I tend to do things on my own. So I get so much pressure of my three retail customers that I cave and I say, okay, all good. You want more promotion support? I'll give it to you. You want a fresher product? I'll give it to you. I'll even keep the so-called promotion horizon that's now set to be short. So companies, my retailers tell me as late as possible about promotions they're running. Again, making their life easier. I won't even bother about that. So I'm caving and I'm going to, uh, when I visit my customers, I'm renegotiating with them. And I'm saying, hey, okay, you can have your 80% of shelf life still remaining. And I will increase the promotional pressure to being heavy 
from the middle setting that I have. So I'm going to support you. I'm going to support you in a better way. So that's now uh, that's now in. Uh, so with my one, with my first customer, and I'm going to do this for the other two customers as well. So yeah, as a as a salesperson, I'm not really collaborating in that sense well with my three other functional department heads, um, and I'm simply going along with my uh, with my clients. And we're going to see in a moment how that turns out. And that's why I'm also going to involve you again with Mentimeter, because we will go over there in a second, uh, and then I will ask you what you think will happen. And so let's also put this to heavy. Let's calculate this to see where my contract goes. And then we've plugged in this deal. And now, and I need to move away this little piece on my screen so I can touch the calculate button. Now I'm gonna calculate the outcome and I'm gonna say okay to that. And I'm gonna ask you, to tell me what will have what you think will happen. So going to Mentimeter, talking about the supply chain resilience, management culture, having a um, having a sales manager that that goes rogue in this supermarket war times, not having uh, looked for any type of collaboration. What do you think as the audience will happen in terms of will obsolete go up? because of me promising a fresher product? Will we incur more penalties because I'm making a more ambitious promise to my customers, but they were already penalizing me? Will my production costs go up as a result of me accepting more demand volatility, but having done nothing about capacity available? Or will my purchase value go up? Uh, perhaps as a result of these obsoletes that will, uh, that will also uh, that will also go up. So well, I see many, um, many blue bulbs dropping in from the audience. So that's looking good. And the number is, uh, is going up. So yeah, I'll give you uh, a little bit more time. So uh, I can be ready on time as well with my session. Still being voted. So that's good to know. You're involved and um, so we're being interactive, which is always nice in a webinar. Now let's see uh, what, uh, what happens based on, uh, based on the outcome. Uh, I'm gonna go over there and I think most people have, uh, have voted. If I look at the numbers that I see, then we're very close to 150. Even more people are of course, also giving more answer options here. So choose all that apply. We have all oh, 70 votes in at the moment. So that's uh, that's going pretty well. So okay, let's uh, let's have a look at what the fresh connection results are telling me. What happened? So going back here, we have a result. Oops, 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 oops. I see this result already on the bottom of my screen, where I'm being um, benchmarked against other teams in this uh, in this particular setup. And if I go to finance, then whoa. Well, this is what uh, going rogue means. If you go if you go it alone then uh, from a sales perspective in this case, then it didn't turn out so well. So penalties have gone up. That was one of the things that we spoke about. We have incurred way more penalties. Now, what happened to our obsoletes? If I go to sales, to the sales role, I had a KPI there and that KPI has now gone to 12%. It's on the left-hand side of my screen. And a gimmicky trend graph that you see in front of obsolete products has has gone up. It was there was already some obsoletes going on, but it even uh, became higher. So obsoletes absolutely went up. Then going back to finance, what happened to my production cost? Well, my production cost, I already was in a situation where I had capacity shortages because of a lot of flexible manpower. That flexible manpower increased. I had to replace this these this this increased obsoletes. So. I still need to make all my deliveries to my customers that they're asking me about. And if my inventory goes obsolete, I need to replace it. I need more, even more production time, causing more flexible manpower. And I also need to use more components for that than I normally would have. So because of the obsoletes, I have unnecessarily high purchase value. I have unnecessarily high production cost. Okay, having said that, let's then 
go back to the PowerPoint and say, hey, okay, there's more elements that we can work on. We've looked at the cultural part. People of sales was going, going it alone, not really working well together. Well, let's then look at collaboration. And if we look at collaboration, what would have happened if this particular VP of sales would have spoken somewhat more strict with his, uh, with his clients and saying, yeah, I'm willing to uh, support your increased promotion pressure. I'm willing to deliver you a fresher product, but can we at least have a somewhat lengthier promotion horizon? Can you at least tell me a little bit earlier about the promotion coming so I can prepare better? If I know about the promotion coming and I can already lock up part of that demand volatility in my production plan, that, uh, that would also have been very helpful. Uh, and not only that, um, the supply chain person also starts visiting his operations colleague and his supply chain, uh, the, the sales colleague, I should say. So the, the sales VP also is going to visit his operations colleague and his supply chain colleague and discuss with them a number of changes as well. And I'm going back to the simulation and let's then go back to the sales role first and say, okay, uh, renegotiating with my customers, at least uh, working together with them in a more in a, in a, in a way that is that is uh, meaningful for both of us, that has value for the both of us. Let's set this promotion horizon to be middle. Uh, so at least as fresh connection, I know I have somewhat more lead time to anticipate this and to work with this. So I put this to middle. I, I do this for the other two customers as well. So the middle setting actually means that four weeks before a promotion kicks in at retail, I know about it. And when it was set to short, it was only one week. So now I go to, uh, to four weeks. So that is helpful. And then having done that, I'm going over to supply chain. And I'm telling supply chain, I'm asking supply chain, can we also be a bit more flexible become a bit more flexible in terms of our production plan. If I run out of stock, I would like to react somewhat earlier. So instead of freezing my production schedule for three weeks, let's freeze it for two weeks. Let's plug that in. And at the same time, um, since I have to deliver a fresher product and I want to prevent these obsoletes, let's instead of producing every 10 days, let's produce every five days. So actually, effectively reducing my lot size of my production of the, of the finished products that I produce. So let's save that and make sure that that is in. And since I have been able to get a, a middle, middle term promotion arising from my customers, being able to lock up some of this demand volatility in my production plan that I also can change now every two weeks that I, that I don't freeze any longer than two weeks, I can do with a lot less safety stuff. So that's also helpful. And let's see here if I can get the number plugged in. Here we go. Oh, I shouldn't do that here. That was five. That's the nerves. I want 1.5. Zoom is in the way a bit, sometimes activates. So that is all in now. And now having done all this, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to produce more often. I have more change over time. So let's go to operations and also speak with operations and say, I need an extra shift in bottling because if I need to deal with this kind of, um, this kind of changeovers, I was already in a situation where I had a lot of flex labor. So let's add an extra shift, save this. Now I've done a lot of changes. Now I have collaborated properly with, uh, with my clients. I have collaborated properly with the people in the supply chain, functional head there. I spoke to the functional head of operations. So now I'm gonna calculate again and I'm going back to Menti and I'm gonna have another question for you. So let's push the calculate button. Are we sure? Yes, we are. So this is going to happen, that's running. Let's go back to Menti then and ask you the next question. So the supply chain collaboration piece that we're now looking at, what do you think will mostly improve because of these changes that we made? Yeah, so we have gotten our clients as far as that they are, we're giving us a promotion horizon of being middle. So they told us earlier about promotions coming. 
we've worked with our colleagues in supply chain and operations. So we got a shorter frozen period. We got less safety stock and that could be done because we knew about demand volatility dropping in earlier. If not, if we wouldn't have known that, we could never have done that. We could produce more frequently, both give us less inventory. And because we have less inventory, we hopefully, well, it's, it's here as well. We hopefully have less obsoletes. And then in operations, we got an extra bottling shift. So that might also be helpful in terms of, I was already in a situation where I had large overtime. Hopefully I will get, uh, I will get less overtime. So yeah, what will it be? Will we have better production plan adherence, better service level, less obsolete, less overtime? Think about this a little bit, uh, about what you think about this. So I see at the moment, 55 people answering and we had 70 people answering in our first question. So I'll be, uh, I'll be a bit patient. We still have 150 people in the session. So that's good. And then in a moment, we will know what, um, what, has, uh, what has been the outcome of our, um, of our action here, of, of actually going into collaboration mode, which is also very much a part of being resilient. If you're able to collaborate well within your company, especially cross-functionally, that's of course a big help in itself, right? It's not a separate topic, like the question that, that Alphonse, Alphonse also uh, more or less already answered. Supply chain resilience, it should actually be baked in. And it should be part of culture. It should be part of, of being a member of a team and, and collaboration. So we have around 69 uh, people that have voted. Let's take a look at, uh, did we improve? Yes or no. Now, I think things have really improved. So, oh, we made a big jump forward. Yeah, so instead of being at minus 21.4%, we're now just below 0%. So we're going to watch profitability, minus 1.11%. And one of the questions was, do we have less obsolete? So let's see, the number was 12%. Where is that number now? It's not 9.9, .9. it's still not nothing, but it has dropped a bit. Do we have less overtime? That will also show in our, in our finance uh, position. So if I look at finance, flexible manpower, yeah, that dropped. Of course, we also added a shift. Eh? We need to be honest about that. So we added a shift that's giving us more cost, uh, but we dropped a lot in flexible manpower. And especially that helped us in reducing the penalties big time eh? because we improved service level because of this extra capacity. Penalties are for the bigger part now gone. So it's not only the extra cost of the shift, uh, saving us flexible manpower because these two together were not even that big of a deal, but preventing this large number of penalties was of course also great. And, and production plan adherence, if I go to my operations area, I have a KPI on that. Let's see what the trend graph says. Well, production plan adherence, the little gimmicky trend graph sharply up. So around 89%. So that's, um, that's a lot better, but we still have some penalties as well. So, We'll go to that in a minute as well. So we've covered this piece and now let's go to the supply chain re-engineering part in a limited sense, yeah, one byte at a time. So especially looking a bit more at supply chain understanding, that's what we, uh, that's what we can spend some time on because I would like to understand now that I still have some penalties. Uh, I'd like to get rid of those because I would like to make my customers happy. It's about walking the talk. So going back to, uh, to the simulation, what is then going on? I'm going to the My Company screen. I'm promising 95% of service level, so I'm still incurring some penalties. So let's first go to the sales area and take a look at my customer reports. How are my customers doing? And my customer report is telling me, and I need to look at the fourth column from the left, service level and order lines, because that's also how I'm being measured in my contracts. For those of you that uh, pay attention to detail that were, were quick enough to spot it, you could see in the contracts that the service level that you were promising, you were, you were measured on an order, at order line level. And you can see now that for all my three customers, I'm just a little bit below the 95% of service level that I'm promising. So 
yeah, that is the reason that I still have these modest penalties and that every once in a while, they're not so happy. And they say, hey, you did not deliver according to what you promised. So if I take a look at that from a different angle, if I go to the product report in sales, I can look at how my products have done in terms of service level. And again, I said service level type being what aligns it. That's what you can see here on the right-hand side in the contract with, for instance, food and groceries, service level type being auto line. That's why I looked at that, at that performance. So going to my product report, looking at that, and I have a column here also called service level order lines. It's a bit right from the middle of this screen. And there I can see that actually for four of my six products, I am above 95% of service level. So these, these products are not giving me any issues in terms of the few penalties that I still have. But I have two products that have in the description C, meaning vitamin C, and those are well below 95, they're even below 90%. And so they are 89.2 coincidentally both. So yeah, there's probably something going on with my vitamin C then, because in each product there go oranges, and in three of my products is one liter carton and, and, and a pet bottle. Mango is in two of my products, no issue, but I do seem to have a problem with my vitamin C. So let's go to supply chain then, and let's take a look at my component report and see if I have an issue with components, so-called component availability. And what does this tell me? Well, I have my five components here, and the fifth one, vitamin C, has an incoming delivery reliability of a little above 80%. So that's not good. And then of course I have safety stock in place for my, uh, for my components. And this safety stock is helpful, but my component availability of, and then you need to go all the way to the right to almost the last column on the right. My component availability for vitamin C is only 92%. Okay, so that's where the issue is coming from in terms of these two end products still not meeting the 95% service level requirement. Okay, so having said that, um, well, the, the quickest way out of here is, of course, increasing safety stock. Uh, but yeah, increasing safety stock, that means more investment in, uh, in, 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 uh, in components here and that, that's eating up space in my warehouse as well. So when we speak about supply chain understanding, it's not only about looking for this com the component in this case that's causing the issue, but if I would simply increase safety stock, what else am I then? doing. Now I'm looking also at the column called demand per week in pieces or liters. It's a little bit to the right of the middle. Uh, and it says here that if I look at my vitamin C usage, that's only 200 liters a week, which is very little. So if I increase safety stock, there won't be a big space uh, impact. Now I can also check my finance statement and say, what am I spending on vitamin C then? Because if I in, in, increase my safety stock there, I'm investing money, so that's tied up. Now, in one period, I'm only using 2,500 for my vitamin C. So I'm not that worried. So let's go to the purchasing area. And um, also look at what the service level is with this particular supplier only 90%, so we can also do something about that. That will increase the price because I'm asking for more supply chain performance from their end, but I'm not that worried because I'm spending very little with them, so that will go up by 5%. I see this so-called contract index signal to me, I'm gonna pay 5% more, 5% of 2,500, big deal. So that's not a thing that I'm worried about. And then I'm also going to supply chain management and I'm gonna be, quite straightforward and say, I want four weeks of safety stock to cover me against this too low component availability. So that's now in. So having said that, so my purchasing contract is in, let's check if that's well done. 99% here, yeah, supply chain management. We have four weeks set for safety stock. Let's calculate and let's go back to Menti and ask you what you think will happen this time. So being a mentee, going to the next question. Okay, 
what will be the strongest effect, do you think, of increasing the service level with my existing supply of vitamin C and at the same time increasing the safety stock for vitamin C? Do you think inventory investment will go up? Do you think we need a lot more warehouse space or do you think we will have better component availability? Uh, less penalties from customers, perhaps. What do you think will uh, will be the impact of the changes that I made to vitamin C uh, safety stock and, and supplier agreement that I had in place? So uh, just think about that for a little while. And uh, at the moment, at, uh, whilst you are thinking and saving the company, I'm, uh, I was having a sip of coffee, as you can see. So I'm very happy that you're running my business at the moment. That makes my life a lot easier. Now we see that the, uh, the answers are, are, are inclining towards better component availability for vitamin C. That is also, of course, something that we are after. And then less penalties from, uh, from customers as well. But there are also people that are saying inventory investment will go up and we need more warehouse space. Um, I do think those both things will happen, but to a lesser degree, that would be my, uh, my educated guess here. So yeah, um, it seems that the number of people that are answering is sort of stabilizing. We're growing towards uh, 60 in this case. We were at 70 for the other two questions. So I'll give you a little bit more time, but I also need to mind the time and, and pay attention to uh, to our last speaker of today, of course, Zira, who is uh, who's also in our program and we should make sure that she has enough time to do her story. Okay, so let's go back uh, and see what happens. And now going to finance, I'm seeing that I'm now in a position where customers are no longer penalizing me. That's a relief. So they're even giving me a little bonus. That means I'm overperforming a bit. So that is absolutely great because now I'm really walking the talk. So they're very happy. Now, did the inventory investment, for instance, go up? Let's see if that happens. Inventory investments, slightly. Not a big deal. That did not really hurt us. Did the stock cost go up? So the inbound warehouse, we have heavy overflow in the inbound warehouse, but yeah, that increased only slightly. Okay? So the inbound warehouse is too small. That's what these numbers tell me. But that was already the case. So the extra inventory that we're now holding for vitamin C is costing me less than 2,000 extra. But yeah, I got less penalties. Uh, that's helpful. Okay? That's, that got me another 22,000. And did my component availability now also improve? Because that's what I was looking for. And let's have a look. And look at, um, at the numbers here. Okay, so we are at 100% now for vitamin C. So that was a really helpful action. So then I have one more thing that I would like to, uh, to go over with you in this uh, particular session. I'm gonna take a look at, uh, at agility and especially at the velocity part. Because um, uh, you already noticed that we have a large uh, overflow in the inbound warehouse. That's what I just saw in, um, in the inbound warehouse on the finance statement. And I'm using a lot of pet bottles as well. I have this report still open. Um, so I'm using a lot of pet bottles. I have a supplier that's not really doing a, a great job. Uh, their delivery performance is also not that great. I've plugged in a lot of safety stock to cover me. So um, yeah, that, that is helpful, but still pet bottles are really voluminous. Uh, so let's have a look at where this supplier is sitting, because if I'm, if I'm buying pet bottles, I would like, uh, I'm not only buying plastic, but I'm also buying a lot of air. And at the same time, I'm driving around a lot of air. So what I would like to do is taking a look at the, at the supplier markets whom we have available for pet supply. Let's see if we comparing to the current contract that I have, if we can find a supplier looking through the velocity lens that has a shorter lead time than the one that I have now that will save me in transportation cost. 
Um, and also taking a look at what I'm storing in terms of lot size, because um, that eats up a lot of warehouse space. So I have the current principal supplier is Trio Pet, as they're called. Um, and I have a contract with them that's not really working for me because I saw that I also have low delivery reliability. But they're 10 days apart from me in terms of lead time. Now, okay, I also have Philip Jones. They are five days, five days away in, um, in terms of lead time. And then I have one that's 15 days away in terms of lead time. So that's signaling to me that Philip Jones is actually the better choice. That they're, and they're also based in the Netherlands. Eh? So that, that's really helpful uh, because TrioPet is in Spain. So yeah, that's really helpful. And the other one is in France. So the Netherlands, that's close by, that's close to home. So that means a lot less driving around. So I'm going over there. And since the volumes that I'm buying are so big, I'm going to buy full truck loads. I would like to have high quality because that also makes sure that I have less breakdowns in my bottling line, the better the quality is. So I'm gonna calculate. And this one is at component level, quite a bit more expensive than the one that I had, than, than Trio Pet. I say this by heart. So I plug in deal. And then I'm heading over to the inbound warehouse. Sorry, I'm heading over to supply chain first because I said that I was going to lower the lot size of pet bottles to make sure that we're not storing so much air. So I'm gonna do, if you deliver me, deliver me one week's worth of expected usage. That's a lot better than, than four weeks worth of expected usage. That's about 30 trucks in total. I, I did the, 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 the calculation on that not that long ago. So uh, having that in place and then I could also lower actually the size of my inbound warehouse. I still have overflow in this round, but I'm taking out so much space need because of this pet that I trust that I can do with a lot, a lot less with a, with, a, with a smaller warehouse. So, okay, I've done all this. Let's calculate this outcome. Am I sure? I'm sure. And then go over to Menti for a question to you. So what do you think will be the impact of, um, of changing the supplier and at the same time changing the size of the warehouse? What do you think will happen? Will purchase value increase? Will the inbound warehouse overflow increase or will the ordering cost increase? And so what do you think will happen in this particular setup? Answers are dropping in. I'm already a bit in my Q&A time, but we're good on that. So um, I will make sure that I'm uh, ready at 4.30. So Zira can start on time with her part in this webinar. Okay, purchase value will increase. That's, um, that's, that's uh, something that is remarkable. And um, that's because I think you were, uh, I told you that the component price was going up, but there's some total cost of ownership thinking going on here as well. Ask, just ask yourself, purchase value, that's, um, that's also transportation cost included. And if I have to drive less kilometers, that effect might not be that, uh, that hefty as you think it is. So 52 people answered this question. Let's see where we are then uh, with, uh, with, the, with the outcome. Also minding the time. All right, so, oh, I see now that we are in positive territory. So if I look at finance, I have now a positive result, uh, which is good. It's still not a result that I would like to go back with to the boardroom time and time again, because we would like to go even higher than this. Now, did my purchase value increase? Well, actually it didn't, because I drive around less a lot less with uh, with my plastic and especially with the air. So my transportation cost dropped dramatically. So the component cost increased a bit because Philip Jones was selling the bottles at a somewhat higher price than Trio did, but there was a lot less transportation cost involved. Then inbound warehouse overflow will increase. Well, I dropped the lot size for buying pet bottles from four to one week, and I even decreased the warehouse size and look here. The warehouse is smaller and the overflow is also gone for the bigger part. So that was also a big save that helped me. And then the ordering cost, did they increase? Administration, yes, ordering cost did increase. I ordered more often 
but that was really, really a modest impact. So yes, this is, um, this is what happened. And going back to this slide, was there anything else we should have done? So just already going towards Q&A, if we go back to Mentimeter, this is a word cloud question. Is there anything else that you can think of at the moment that we should have taken into account, that we should have taken, that is a measure that we should have taken to make our supply chain even more resilient? I'll uh, give you a few more minutes to, uh, to ponder on this and just fill in a word that comes to mind where you say, well, Hans, it's all nice that you've done this, but just answer a word that you think of um, as a topic that we should have paid attention to. Is there anything that you can think of? Yeah, integration. Oh, that's a nice one. Integration, yeah. Um, and I, 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 th I think you mean that from a point of view of, of integrating as a team or integrating in the supply chain, vertical integration also, also mentioned already. Cultural changes, yeah, although that's not hard. Yeah? As they say, uh, culture has strategy for breakfast. So cultures can be very strong and, and not that, uh, that easy to change training. Yeah, I do believe that training is very helpful, especially when it's done cross-functionally. So yeah, lots of, uh, lots of, uh, of, of words popping up here. So, okay. Let's head over then back to the, to the, to the PowerPoint. Um, really nice to see how this word cloud develops, but what pops out is training a lot, but VMI as well. Training, collaboration, strategy. I like those words. Okay, heading back here. So yeah, you've actually gone in a little sense through the magic circle of experiential learning. This is a circle and an approach that we use a lot. You go through an experience, after the experience, we reflect about it. We've done this in a very brief way a couple of times. We conceptualize, for instance, we could have spoken about VMI as a concept that we could have adopted. And then we apply what we've learned, what we've conceptualized in an either a next round of such a simulation or you apply it elsewhere in your own work. So that's how you get return on education. Now, in a normal setting, we use this for training mostly our simulations. So then you're together in multiples of four four available VP roles. You go online in the cloud. We deliver these kind of sessions face-to-face -face or virtual. And then you come to terms with based on the setup that we choose and based on your learning goals, how you can have this supply chain learning experience as a cross-functional team. So that's what we mostly do. But if we have managed to whet your appetite already, then you can already join us for a global annual supply chain tournament. The biggest tournament that is, that is actually out there and that's the so-called Fresh Connection Global Professional Challenge. That's experiential learning. And uh, you can enter into this tournament that starts already on April 19. And the key topic of this tournament will be supply chain resilience. And there's big prizes and big fame to be won as well. Uh, you can check more details on our website uh, that you see there with a the URL, but you can also leave your name and email address in the Zoom chat or in Menti Q&A yeah, so Menti is here. In this Menti Q&A, you can also plug in your name and email address, and that will not be shared with others. So you can also leave it here. And if you do so, we will get back to you, or our partners will, depending on the country that you're in, and then we can follow up with you. So that's what we, uh, that's what we plan. So yeah, uh, I, I will open up for Q&A. We have about six minutes left for Q&A before I'm going to make room for Zira, so she has her full 30 minutes that uh, that she has on the program. Noah, do we have uh, do we have questions? Uh, not many. I saw one that uh, asked if there is a free demo for the Fresh Connection available. Yes, definitely. If people uh, if people navigate to uh, to our website www.inchange.com, they can uh, find their way there to uh, to get a free trial. So to to get uh, to get their, their feet wet a little bit as well with the, with the fresh connection, absolutely available. And then Any, we had uh, yeah. then we had another one saying, could be the lean methodology a way for preserving or improving the supply chain resilience, but decrease any risk? Uh, that's um, on one hand you have lean, um, that, that, that's actually lean is being mentioned as perhaps one of the reasons that we sometimes run into issues now because supply chains may have become too lean. 
Yeah, so on one hand, I think the focus from lean, um, especially the, the, the part of, of waste and value stream mapping, I think is, is really, really good. But um, yeah, because you don't want to have any activities that don't add value seen through the eyes of customers. You don't want to do anything that is that is considered waste, uh, whether that's time spent, whether that's that's uh, inventory that you have lying around. On the other hand, um, and especially in these global supply chains, we've seen that focusing for especially for important components that you need on, on one supplier only single sourcing has proven to be very risky um, since these supply chains have become so lengthy uh, and, and, and visibility is uh, not what we've come across all of us. And I, I, I don't doubt that Zira can also uh, add some words to that later on in her talk. 